Hey. Good morning. How you morning. doing? I'm doing all right. Thanks. Awesome. How are you? I'm, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that question. I'm, uh, okay. well, pins and needles, uh, pretty much. So, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm at that space where I'm ready to uh, move on the next thing that I want to do, uh, but I can't do it yet. So I feel like I'm mm -hmm. being kind of held back and, um, mm -hmm. you know, I'm just trying to, to focus on uh, what is in front of me at the present moment because um, my brain wants to keep going to uh, the next thing. So, mm -hmm. Okay. But yeah, I'm excited. I'm planning to uh, get on the road on Wednesday. Um, so I'm going to hang around and do the town hall uh, Tuesday night uh, so I can see Tony and, and everybody else. Uh, and then Wednesday morning after I wake up, uh, pack up the car, drop off paperwork at the lawyer's office, leave the key, and uh, get on the road. Nice. <laughs> How long is the drive? I have no idea. Um, like I, I honestly have not uh, done a whole lot of planning other than, you know, choosing a destination and thinking, you know, I know some folks like uh, along the way that I can stop and see. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's literally just going to be like a day by day process of, all right, how far did I get today? And how far do I think I can get tomorrow? So. Nice. Yeah, it's going to be an adventure. So, yeah. Yeah. Sounds fun. <laughs> we'll see. I, don't know, I had uh, a guy up in New York uh, that I'd been talking to, God, I don't know, since like April, I think, who was wanting to make the trip with me. And I was like, yeah, that's cool. You know, I'd love to have a travel buddy. Um, but apparently he's, he couldn't like get his logistics squared away to be able to do it. So now I'm, you know, just by myself, which is uh, mm. adding a whole different level of pressure, uh, but uh, it's it'll be fine. I'm sure it'll work out. Yeah, I will. You'll get there. <laughs> oh, yeah. All right. So, how was your week, other than uh, feverishly trying to uh, crank out uh, another uh, piece of the puzzle? Um, it was good. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it was, it was feverish, I suppose, but, you know, kind of just sometimes you just get into a flow state and it just happens. So that's kind of what I had. That's kind of what happened this time. I didn't really have to try too hard, which is great. That's, that's ideal Nice it's for it to just come naturally. So I did that. I was thinking a lot about, um, you know, just. Whenever I, I write these things, my mind is occupied with the the kind of the main themes. So I was just thinking a lot about, you know, like biosensors and surveillance and, and all that. So just been kind of uh, walking down some weird rabbit holes. <laughs> so trying not to get too um, too involved because it can kind of drive you crazy, you know. Hmm. Yeah, it, it'll definitely do that. I'm actually kind of surprised that we didn't uh, bump into each other in some of those rabbit holes because it sounds like we were in the same general area for a while. Yeah, were you look, so what I wanted to kind of talk about is I'm not sure if we really went into this too much was um, the Total Information Awareness Program, um, mm -hmm. Poindexter, PRISM, and then Snowden and kind of the aftermath of all of all of that let's say uh that's a big one uh and i'm happy to talk about it uh because i actually did a fair amount i would call it a fair amount of research uh not this past week but the one previous uh on uh the information awareness office the projects that they had going on in the early 2000s uh and then i also kind of um, dove off into another DARPA program that is curiously not mentioned in the book at all, okay. which is uh, LifeLog. And it was actually running uh, concurrently 
with total information uh, awareness. Uh, and there are some very interesting parallels between the two programs, you know, not just the fact that they were both uh, dealing with the collection and analysis of uh, information. Okay. It's almost like they have these redundant systems so that if one fails, they have a backup. Yeah. Or like the way I've always looked at it is, you know, you've got uh, a team of scientists working on a problem because, you know, one or two may come up with a couple of good ideas. But if you've got like five or six or 20, uh, you're going to have a lot more brain power to, mm. to draw from. Yeah, definitely. True. But I mean, why would they, um, why do they separate them into different, you know? projects if they're accomplishing or aiming to accomplish the same thing it's my question well i mean that that kind of in in my mind it goes back to the whole idea of uh compartmentalization in in other words you might have like these two projects running concurrently with one another and from the outside at you know the the twenty five thousand foot level it appears that they're working on creating the same product but in reality they're actually coming at it from different points of view where one might be looking at it mm -hmm. from say like the military applications of what you would be able to do with this technology the other one could be looking at it from uh, the standpoint of being able to create some sort of like consumer product out of it that would enable, enable you to mm -hmm. do the exact same things, but instead of focusing on uh, the theater of combat, you're focusing more on the broad, uh, you know, economic systems uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so it just kind of... Is that what LifeLog is doing? Well, interesting. You should ask that question because, so let me see. Because there's not a whole lot of information on the program itself, or at least not that's readily available. Like, I, if I had spent like a good week uh, trying to to dive in and uncover like as many details as I possibly could, I probably would have found a lot more. Um, but I literally spent like I don't know, maybe four hours, five hours, something like that, just finding what was readily available. Um, but. So some of the things that they were looking at collecting as far as personal identifiers uh, for data aggregation were things like credit card purchases, um, the websites that people would visit, the content of phone calls and emails, uh, scans of faxes and postal mail, contents of instant messages, books and magazines that had been read, TV and radio programming selections, uh, physical locations recorded via wearable GPS and biomedical data captured through wearable sensors, which when you look at that mm. list, you know, it, it might not be every single one of those things was what TIA was focusing on and trying to identify terrorists. Um, but a good 75 to 80 percent of that list were the exact same things that TIA wanted to collect and be able to analyze. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's pretty in-depth. Um, uh, so basically um, what that seems to me is like they're trying to collect data so that they can have a good idea of what you're gonna do next. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, um, I don't even remember. I think this might've even been Wikipedia. Yeah. This was Wikipedia that I was getting this information from, believe it or not. Uh, they say that the high level goal of the project was to identify preferences, plans, goals, and other markers of intentionality. In other words, being able to figure out what people were going to do based on their patterns of past behavior. So I think cybernetics, is, essentially. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely cybernetics. I think that they're doing this for a number of reasons. So first would be to, you know, predict market outcomes. Um, 
and and put new products on a market that people will buy, right? It's like kind of like it's it's advertising without the actual ad. Um, so they're advertising a product to you that they know that you'll buy, right? So they're just putting it in front of you to buy. Um, but also all this information is really important for understanding like decision-making and the way that intentions uh, operate. And I think that that's a really tricky aspect to kind of um, code. So if you're trying to, I don't know, write a code for an AI to be, at least resemble human uh, interaction with the environment and, you know, uh, kind of resemble having intention, um, you'd want to model it off of people's intentions. Uh, and I think that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to create some like artificial model of uh, conditions plus intentions with the outcome of behavior so that, I mean, it might, I don't know why it, uh, I think that there's a, a, a big, very big arms race happening to, to get to AI uh, or generalized AI. Um, so that's the way I kind of see these things in, uh, in relation to. So, uh, I mean, anything that, any, any sort of data collection or like um, uh, way that they can formulate these or make laws out of um, these behaviors that you see in humans, because we know that they're conscious, conscious and intelligent. Um, they're trying to find ways to code those or create rules or laws that they can add into the makeup or like the, you know, the binary makeup of the AI to make it intelligent, right? So that might be something that they're doing. I don't know. Yeah. I well, no, I, I, think, think that I think that's definitely a part of it because that, that ties into the whole aspect of what they call machine learning, uh, where when, you know, you have the, the data collection that's happening on the social networks uh, and the things like when you try to sign into a website or something like that and you get the, the little uh, recapture box where it's like, oh, pick these squares that have, you know, this thing in it and don't pick any of the squares that don't have it. Like that's, that's all meant to teach the uh, whatever it is that they're developing, whether we can actually call it AI or not. Um, it's taking the, the human input and feeding it into that system in order to make it smarter somehow um mm. how how they're actually like the whole part that that i haven't understood and you know maybe now that i'm actually taking the time to to think about it, it it starts making a little bit more sense but like you know when they they present you that box of 12 squares and they're like pick all the squares that have a crosswalk in it well th these are all visual cues so like what is what is the actual uh purpose of you know, the machine being able to identify a crosswalk in a picture. Um, and maybe it's it's not so much that it's the crosswalk itself that's important, but it's being able to quickly scan an image and identify the usable data uh, within it. I don't know. It's uh, It seems hmm. kind of a flimsy premise, but um, there, there's, there's got to be something more to it than just these simple tasks that uh, that they're putting in front of the rest of us. You know what I mean? Well, I, I will say that, um, art of, I mean, like we read in uh, the book, it's fairly, really difficult for uh, machines to determine what's a shadow and what's an object. And that's really, our, our uh, intelligence is a very complex thing. It's very much, um, continuous and instantaneous feedback between us and the environment. So I think it would be a really difficult task for an, an artificial intelligence to look at a screen, read the sentence, click all the squares with a crosswalk in it, and then do the task correctly. I think that that's actually a pretty big reach for that. Um, although they'd like you to think that it's that we're way beyond that. Because if, if, if I would say in the most advanced way that um, these 
uh, artificial intelligences are functioning right now is in the uh, the realm of language because it is a closed system. Um, there's a little room for, I mean, it's grammar and content, right? So it's basically like a math problem. But when you have when you introduce an environment to it, when you introduce objects, shadows, um, irony, um, illusion to the environment, it's gonna get it, like immediately lost. Yeah. Well, yeah, and that was that was actually one of the um, one of the programs in total information awareness was specifically designed around that type of uh, closed network system. Let me see if I can find it in my, yeah. So it was called, um, yeah, Communicator. And what they wanted to do was they wanted to develop a, uh, a very limited dialogue interaction between humans uh, and computers so that the two would be able to interface with one another and there would be absolutely no ambiguity in the language that both of them were using to try and, and identify whatever it is, you know, that they were trying to accomplish. Um, so that actually that, makes a, a fair amount of sense. Isn't that where Siri comes from? Yes. Yeah. That we all use nowadays and we're all training constantly by using it. It's I becoming don't, better and better. I don't, I, don't I have never used that <laughs> shit and I never will. Well, that's not fair. I, I do say, uh, hey, Siri, whenever I'm in a uh, crowded room and I want to piss like half the people in the room off. I have done that before. <laughs> yeah. But no, hey, it's... Siri, go uh, Google Project Communicator. <laughs> nice. Well, there, there's that. Uh, think about this too, because another one of the programs in total information awareness was uh, one that was called EARS, which stood for Effective, Affordable, Reusable Speech mm -hmm. to Text. And that's something that is incorporated in pretty much every device nowadays, it, it, at least every mobile device, if not every PC that is available on the market, you know, speech to text, it's become ubiquitous. And again, we've been training it over the course of the last 15 years or so, because even though we know we're not supposed to do things like drive and text, people are like, oh, well, I can get around that because I can just have my phone read the text to me, and then I can speak my response back to it so that I don't have to take my eyes off the road and I can keep driving. And you know what you could also do is just call the person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that requires effort. You know, talking to your phone doesn't require as much effort. But they, again, they rely on, on this. They, they identify the, the ways that, that people are going to follow the paths of least resistance. And then they gamify those paths mm -hmm. so that, people will be more likely to choose them. Yeah, I mean, on um, I'm not an uh, Apple user outside of my computer, but um, on, my, on my phone, I have a Google Assistant, and my Google Assistant wants me to play games with it, and it wants to tell me riddles and jokes and hear my responses and all this. Um, you know, they, they're trying to figure out how they can get you to interact with it more um, mm -hmm. by offering features that you may or may not find useful. I mean, to me, it just makes things more difficult. Uh, if anything, I'm, pr I'm pretty good at doing those things myself. So when you add one extra layer of complication, that is really erroneous at, at times. Like it, it's, again, these things, they would like you to think are very advanced. But when uh, what is advanced for an artificial intelligence is a very, very, very dumb intelligence still. Um, it's really not all that uh, close to getting to, um, as if I were talking to a person, a real assistant, right? It's nowhere near that. 
but uh, you know, it requires a lot of training, a lot of training, a lot of data, uh, and they're hoping to use that to get it to be better. You know, it, to me, it brings to mind the story of the Google engineer uh, that has been uh, floating around for the last couple of weeks or so, where he's, mm -hmm. uh, you know, basically acting in the capacity of whistleblower and saying, hey, we've already got this, this AI and I talk to it on a regular basis. It's part of my job and it's, you know, about the level of a seven or an eight-year-old. Um, and, you know, of course, people are going to do whatever they want to do with that story. That's it. I think it was, it was put out more as a distraction than uh, anything else, but it did get me to thinking if just based on the limited amount of knowledge that I have about artificial intelligence, how it works and some of the complications that have arisen in the past as they've tried to build these thinking machines if they were actually able to get to the point where they could construct uh, software that was able to learn on its own, wouldn't it, again, because it's being built by humans, wouldn't it necessarily follow the same progression as a human being would? In other words, wouldn't it have to be in existence for you know, a massive amount of time in order to like, in order for it to, to reach the level of thinking like a human adult would think like, wouldn't it have to be in existence for like 20, 25 years? Cause the, the yeah, one thing and it that, may, it, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, and, and it may turn out to be one of those people you just don't like, yeah. you know, it, uh, if it's learning on its own, it's going to learn things that are just like people uh, it, um, of interest to it, you know. Um, I just, I don't understand this conversation. It just, it doesn't make any sense to me because if you're, what what it seems like is trying to be accomplished is to create a, an, a non-biological person, mm -hmm. which how is that any better than a biological person? It's only better in the sense that you can enslave it, that it doesn't have natural rights. Um, but if it really truly is a sentient, conscious, intelligent being that can make moral choices in the world, shouldn't it be treated as if it is a, well, is it as all other uh, sentient, conscious, moral, moral actors in the world are treated, right, as individuals with rights. So they're, they're almost creating something to get around um, natural rights, but they're just creating another problem, which is the same exact problem they were dealing with in the beginning. Well, that one's a difficult issue to parse out. I think. And, and the reason why is, again, I don't think that there is any singular goal that is trying to be accomplished uh, with this type of work. I think there are a number uh, of different goals um, that are, are kind of all falling under the same umbrella. Um, you know, I think Obviously, they want to be able to create a, uh, a labor force that is 100% controlled, right? Like it has, has no free will whatsoever. They're literally created to do a job. They do the job as perfect as it can possibly be done. And nobody has to worry about uh, ethical or, or moral dilemmas or, or any of that sort of thing. They're, they're literally just or paying there to them. do a job. Yeah. Or even paying them. Yeah. Because that's even mm -hmm. better, you know? Yeah, it definitely um, devalues labor because, you know, if you can do, if you can get the same labor for free, yeah. why should I pay you for yours? Yeah. And, you know, another, another way to, to kind of come at this is with the way technology and especially computing technology advances over time and how its efficiency improve, improves over time. I mean, 
just doing the math, there's going to come a certain point in time. We may have even already reached that point where computers become more efficient at processing data and determining probabilistic outcomes uh, than human beings are capable of doing. So, you know, there's, there's all different sorts of ways that you can, that you would be able to utilize that technology, whether it's for, you know, the, uh, the best possible outcome for everybody involved or for, you know, the small group of people that have the access to that technology at everybody else's detriment. Um, you know, it's just, it's natural that that is going to happen if we keep developing the technology. Um, so, I mean, it, the applications of a well-developed and efficient artificial intelligence are literally endless. Like, like we could use them for the betterment of our species in so many different ways, but just like any other tool, you know, they, they can also go the other way. Um, and I think it, it really comes down to the fact that we, as a group of people, as a species, have not really taken the time to have the serious discussions that need to be had about how this technology is going to be employed, um, what checks and balances we are going to institute to make sure that you know it, it doesn't fall into the wrong hands and become something that uh, you know, becomes inescapable for everybody else. Um, they've, you know, they, they've had their conferences and, and all those sorts of things over the past couple of decades. And yeah, there's this facade that, that the discussion has taken place, but it really hasn't because when, when you look at even like legislation that various countries across the world have enacted, um, yeah, you might not be able to accomplish what you want in that country, like similar to the gain of function moratorium that happened here in the United States in the 2010s. But that just means that you set up your lab in another country that doesn't have that legislation in place and you go and do the work there. Yep. So. And I feel like, um, all of these states are operating under the assumption that either the AI will be friendly or it will be, or they have the uh, ability to turn it off if it becomes unfriendly. Hmm. But I mean, it's always those unintended and unforeseeable consequences that jack stuff up. Um, so I think it's important to um, sort of use our predictive nature and that they're trying to engineer in these artificial intelligences and think of and gamify and, you know, theorize about what the potential consequences are and how to avoid those. Uh, for, you know, for instance, if, okay, an AI becomes unfriendly and you're not able to turn it off because it's, I don't know, figured out how to gain power from, you know, different, different structures, um, you know, ha hack into different things or, you know, I, I don't know, you're granting this, you're grant in this, in this idea, you're granting this thing, extraordinary power to learn and to, um, you know, all, all this information, why wouldn't you expect it to be able to sort of um, entrench its own existence? If its existence is very important to itself, why wouldn't it take measures to make sure it doesn't get turned off? So you can't just assume that uh, it's, your plan's going to work just fine every time, because especially with something like this, you're not dealing with um, a, a, like a device or a machine. Uh, it's more of a living sort of being that's changing all the time. It's not just subject to entropy. It's subject to like progression. Yeah. Well, and, and isn't uh, self-preservation one of the things that we use to identify sentience in, in a species? Yeah, it's, it's definitely one of those 
necessary conditions. Yeah. Maybe not sufficient, but definitely necessary. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I was listening to um, uh, the the latest uh, Dark Horse uh, podcast uh, this morning uh, when I was going to the grocery store and, and coming back. Um, and that's uh, for folks who might not have heard it before. That's uh, Dr. Uh, Brett Weinstein uh, and his wife, uh, Heather Hying, who are both uh, evolutionary biologists. Uh, and they look at the world through that lens uh, and offer some, some very unique insights uh, into the world. But uh, Dr. Uh, Weinstein, when he was doing, I think it was his, I think it was when he was doing his doctoral thesis, he had actually discovered a flaw in the laboratory mice that are used for uh, pharmaceutical clinical trials, right? Uh, especially around uh, things like cancer research and, and medication for those applications. Um, and what he discovered is that this flaw in these mice, and it was a genetic flaw, um, is something that came about because of the um, uh, the laboratories that these uh, mice were being supplied from. And essentially it was skewing the data of every trial that these mice were used in, in a specific direction. Right. And when he presented his evidence to uh, peers to, you know, get their thoughts on it and, um, you know, get, get his work published, even uh, all these sorts of things, um, the, the people who chose to take a look at it and kind of participate in fleshing the research out, um, you know, he told the story of um, one scientist that he worked with where when he went to ask her where she was going to publish her work at so that he could cite it in his own when he published it, her response was, oh, no, we're just going to keep this in-house. In other words, we're not going to let this out to the public. We're not going to disseminate this information widely. In other words, this is something we don't want people knowing about because it may potentially hurt our bottom line. So when I talk about like safeguards that we need to have in place, I'm not just talking about like unintended consequences of creating this thing that we have never had previously in our history. And we don't know what all the ramifications of it are going to be yet. I'm also talking about like ways to safeguard ourselves against our own nature and, and, you know, people who would do things such as this, uh, that again would be to their own personal benefit, but yet to everybody else's detriment. Mm -hmm. Cause I mean, it's, it's yeah. not like we don't have ample examples of this type of behavior, especially in the sciences. You know, it, it happens more often than it doesn't is what it seems to me. Yeah. And I mean, well, I, uh, if you, especially if you're going to say, uh, develop such things with the, uh, you know, with the publicly stated goal of bettering humanity and, you know, increasing longevity and, you know, um, assisting your executive functions and telling you what's wrong with you and how to fix it. Um, yeah, that would seem to be a very important part of it is to make sure that it's not being exploited for any sort of um, nefarious purposes. But I mean, again, it's, it's the same thing with gene editing. People aren't looking at it. There are not very many rules on the table to regulate how it's used. So it, it's kind of something that I imagine will be arrived at ad hoc. Hmm. Yeah, just kind of like it always has been in the past. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, okay, well, now we've got this thing, so I guess we have to deal with it. Oh, well, yeah, you know, that didn't really work out how we were thinking, and uh, these guys really uh, caused this catastrophic problem, and now we're having to deal with that, and it's it's really not good for a number of reasons, so mm -hmm. I guess we'll have to just put some rules down. You know, or, why would you trust people to do, to, to do the right thing? Well, 
again, it, it kind of goes back to the whole thing of looking at examples from history and saying, oh, well, we didn't, we didn't handle any of those so well, but we're going to assume that going forward, uh, it's, everything's going to work out, uh, okay. Um, I don't know it, maybe it's just cause I'm older and cause I seem to get more cynical as time goes by, but it seems like a lot of this stuff is, uh, deliberate. Like, so the, the shuttering of the information awareness office at DARPA by Congress, like even reading back through that whole situation 20 years later, the, the speed with which it happened, um, just, it doesn't seem organic. Like it, it looks like it was done on purpose in order to again take those programs out of the public spotlight and put them into the black budgets so that they could continue perfecting them without anybody being aware that it was still going on because um i think it, i think it was actually in the book um sharon weinberger pointed out that there was a i think it was a new york times article uh, that kind of got the whole firestorm behind uh, total information awareness kicked off. And it was like once that piece came out in the New York Times, then there was like a flood of articles over the course of the next several weeks and months uh, that were just echoing the exact same sentiment. And that was what kind of forced it in front of Congress and, uh, you know, uh, made them make a decision on it. Um and it, again, just kind of going through that timeline and, and looking at how all of that took place, like it just, it does not feel organic. Like I said, like it, it looks like it was done deliberately uh, in order to achieve a specific outcome, which is exactly what happened. They, they shuttered that program at DARPA, they handed it off to the NSA and a few other different agencies, basically split it up between a handful of agencies. And then the work just continued as it normally would have. Like with the, um, who was the partner uh, that was working with DARPA on a lot of it? I got them in here somewhere. Yeah, SAIC, Science Applications International Corporation. Like they didn't stop working on these programs just because the information awareness office got shuttered. They went and continued working with the NSA uh, on to, to help create prism. Like you were saying earlier, like that, that didn't stop at all just because yeah. Congress said, no, DARPA can't do this anymore. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, it's like Sharon said in the book is the best way to kill a program is to rename it. Right. And then rename it again. And then I guess if you still need to kill it, then you kill it then. But you don't do it just flat out because people don't like it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ostensive reason for your program existing is because there's a reason for it or a, a use. And in this case, they're trying to, uh, again, predict behavior, understand uh, inten intentions, um, see beyond your skull and into your brain and your mind. <clears throat> to determine who's a terrorist, right? Or who is a bad actor, who's threatening national security, et cetera. So um, in their mind, they have a I think you, I think you hit on it right it. there. It's, it's to identify threats to national security. Yeah. Not, and, not threats to the nation, right? Not threats to the, to the United States, but threats to national security. Mm -hmm. And after all, what is national security? It's security the for the state. Yeah. yeah, it's it's what the government doesn't want the people to know. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, because you know, um, national security can be compromised by uh, its citizens no longer wanting uh, the, its government in power. Um, that's a threat to national security. So it's really important to make sure the right information gets out there. People are thinking the right things. They're doing the right things. They intend to do the right things. It's all it's all one big um, matrix of things that they're trying to control. <laughs> yeah.
It's I, I agree with you 100%. Yeah. Completely manufactured. Um, have you heard of Project Score? Uh, tell me about it. Cuz uh, names uh, I'm I'm sometimes good with, but uh, they tend to slip every now and then. So tell me okay. what it's about. I mean, it's it's on the same line as as everything else. It's just another one of those projects but it's uh it stands for systematizing confidence in open research and evidence which sounds innocuous but the description of it is the department of defense often leverages social and behavioral science sbs research to design plans guide investments assess outcomes and build models of human social systems and behaviors as they relate to national security challenges in the human domain um, so to help address the situation, DARPA's SCORE project uh, aims to develop and deploy automated tools to assign confidence scores to different social and behavioral science research results and claims. Um, so they're trying to figure out what is good data and what is bad data. So they're collecting all the data and then they're also trying to figure out whether or not it's good. Um, as, but again, it's too, It's to model accurately uh, and well human social systems, they call them, or I would say human social networks or something like that. Uh, and then how those, how those uh, individuals, entities, or groups kind of interact and uh, how they operate on the world. So I think what they're actually, what this means is that they're trying to model um, they're trying to muddle, or they're trying to, I mean, it's kind of like they're trying to put, a, as we read about in the book, like creating a 3D map, um, and like a virtual map of the human social realm so that they can do simulations uh, uh, about different effects and how those effects might cause those different pieces to move and so that they can kind of gamify the system um, and make sure that they're what they are doing in maybe different programs uh, is going to have that desired outcome. Yeah, sounds about right. Um, yeah, because it was uh, monitoring social networks was a big part of. Uh, total information awareness. Um, obviously, it was a big part of LifeLog um, because it was, you know, just another source of, of data. Um, and then, what was it? Well, 2004, uh, in February, we have uh, Facebook, the, the granddaddy of social media, comes online. Uh, you know, Twitter follows shortly thereafter. Um, MySpace was even a little bit before Facebook. Um, so it seems to me that this thing that we are told to call social media is really just another form of data aggregation, um, in order to, uh, you know, be able to tie specific sets of data to specific individuals based on identifiers so social networks yeah exactly well the problem with that is that um those connections and networks are really really complicated too um so that's part of the reason why they want ai is to look at those things and then tell them what they want to know about it <laughs> So they can't, they're, they're getting that data and they're like, really, we don't know how to use this. Um, but if we create a machine smart enough to tell us how to use it, then great. Yeah. Because as it stands, it doesn't really, it's not really operable. It's not, oper it's not actionable information. Hmm. It's, uh, it's crazy. It, the, the whole shift from making weapons of war 
to uh, making, uh, I, I don't know what else to call them other than cybernetic systems uh, at this particular agency literally seems to happen overnight. Like, I mean, you, you can make the case that it started back in the 60s when they started developing uh, the, the ARPANET and, and you know, uh, kind of some of the, the research projects that went along with that. But it, it really seems like it kicks into high gear when, you know, the idea of uh, international terrorism is starting to be... Uh, floated into the public discourse um you know and and being able to identify these international threats uh becomes a, a hot topic uh in politics like that that seems to be and maybe it was just that that was when the technology in order to be able to do some of this stuff that they wanted to do really started maturing and those those two things just you know kind of as a happy accident happen concurrent with one another um that i'm sure is is totally plausible but you know again it's just for for my mind and the way it works it's one of those things where it's like ah, it's just a little bit too much of a coincidence that these things all kind of converged at the same time well the best weapon of war is a person so war is really about people. Um, and again, you can't really go much bigger than a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. You can go much smaller. So um, again, they can, the DARPA is really created to address the problem of insurgency, which just means rebellion. Um, so they're fighting against rebellion um, and that has a lot to do with psychology and it, individual behaviors and intentions and social networks and stuff like that. So I don't find the shift to be really inappropriate or off base. Hmm. It's just kind of um, a different way of thinking about weapons, right? Your mind is certainly a weapon. Language is definitely a weapon. Um, then if conditions are correct, then you can mold um, people into great, great weapons of war or prevent them from being so, you know, prevent them from being effective rebels or insurgents, terrorists, whatever you want to call them. So have I told you about the um, the Department of Defense's uh, supercomputer yet? I don't think so. All right. So um, the the book that I told you about from uh, Yasha Levine that discusses the um, the origins and the development of the internet, um, primarily as a a tool of uh, the Department of Defense more than anything else. Um, Department of Defense and, and the uh, intelligence agencies. Um, there's, I can't remember which chapter it is in that book, but there's a chapter in it where he talks about a project that the Department of Defense began in, I want to say it was the 1970s or the 1980s, but they didn't really start making progress on it until like the 1990s. Again, when when computing power got to the point where they could start building these super massive supercomputers that were, you know, uh, capable of like just calculations that had never been possible before. Um, they started building a full scale simulation of the entire planet like down to <laughs> literally down to the blades of grass on the planet so the entire planet all the things in it all the people um full-scale model simulation and their mm -hmm. intent was to use this simulation for war game scenarios right not not just like active conflict war game scenarios but 
you know, like the stuff, what would happen if China did this? What would happen if Russia did that? What would happen if we did this? How would these other countries react to it? Um, and to the best of my knowledge, and again, I haven't done a tremendous amount of research on it. I just, you know, have this, this one um, anecdotal uh, reference as far as it's concerned. But they started this project and it's, it's never ended. Like it's, it's still going on to this day. They, they still have this, uh, this simulation model uh, of the world that they feed, you know, whatever they need to into it to, to get whatever the possibilities of certain actions are out of it. And, and they're literally, from what I can tell, using this to direct the moves that, that they make both in uh, in the theaters of conflict as well as uh, in the, um, well, the, the theater of, of public perception, really. And how's that working out for them? Uh, I don't know. Because uh, unfortunately, <laughs> I don't know anybody that works for the project. So I don't, I don't get to talk to them directly. I, I mean, I would assume that it's going to be wrong a lot. Um, it's going to overgeneralize a lot of things. So if they're too dependent on it, I mean, again, it's just like outsourcing your thinking to something that's really not as smart as you. So sure, it's, it's aware of all of the different players that you might not be able to keep in your head. But how is that, how is that any better than, than what you can do on your own in your head? It certainly can't account for the sentiment of the little people, the little, you know, simulated people in its database or whatever, or, you know, creative thought, memes, stuff like that. No, but I, I would think one thing that it would be capable of approximating is the, um, the behavior of groups of people. Because again, groups of people are far more predictable than individuals are. So again, if you can if you can get people to identify themselves more with a group than as an individual, they are much more suggestible and much easier to uh, approximate from the standpoint of you know what what they are likely to do given you know, whatever input you throw at them. Yeah, I would say uh, the predictability of any group is also tied to the, you know, close nearing end of that particular group. So the more predictable a group gets, the closer it gets to that group's not really being instrumental in in things so it's kind of like institutions where uh the group instead of its its organizational principles being serving the members of the group it kind of becomes about the group itself so that's when people start kind of start leaving um is what i would assume so uh I agree that groups of people are more predictable than individuals, but um, the degree to which a computer simulation can predict the group's behavior is corresponds to the degree of uh, probably, you know, diaspora from that group. So it's I don't know if it could I don't know if it could predict where those people might move to. Um, but people don't want to just be part of a, a thing that is not op is not serving them in any way. It's kind of serving its own purposes. I think people are a lot more complex than than what especially technophiles and scientists would like you to think. They think you're just some predictable animal who's got really nothing interesting uh, to it. But there's a lot more under the surface than than they can predict. It's I, if they're using their models to inform 
policy decisions today, I'd say that they're, it's doing a bad job because um, it really hasn't accomplished much in the way of, I mean, people are very mad. People are very upset. Mm -hmm. with, and if, um, you know, in, in Russia and Ukraine, it's really not working out for them. Uh, there, they've, they've maybe accomplished the goal of distracting you, but uh, I, I really don't know what the purpose is of that conflict, but um, what, what, it whatever the purpose, out. yeah, whatever the purpose of that conflict is, it's not anything that we're being told on the six o'clock news. Uh, I can guarantee you that. Um, what was it? Oh, I started reading uh, this book uh, earlier this week called uh, Secret Empires by uh, the author is Peter Schweitzer. And the first four or five chapters of this book, he is, it's, it's about uh, politicians and how they develop their spheres of influence uh, and then uh, essentially you know, sell that influence to the highest bidder, whether it's in uh, business or politics or wherever. Um, mm. And and essentially how they get away with doing it under the law and, and don't get prosecuted for it. But like the first four or five chapters of this book, he spends talking about the Biden family and the Kerry family almost exclusively. And in the course of doing that, he spends a lot of time focusing on their relationships with uh, politicians and businesses in both China and Ukraine. And the really interesting thing about it is this book does an excellent job of setting the stage and explaining why what is happening in the Ukraine is happening right now. It has everything to do with natural resources, it has everything to do with profit that will be made from those natural resources. And in my mind, if anybody says anything different, then they're probably trying to sell you something because mm. that seems to be what war always comes down to at the end of the day is control of valuable land because there are resources on that land that can be commoditized. So it's like the, yes, the areas. Yes, the one thing that is really. Well, I was just going to say the areas oh, that, I was just that say Russia. The, one, uh, <laughs> the, the areas that Russia is trying to occupy right now uh, are extremely rich, not only in petroleum resources, but also uh, rare earth minerals as well. So mm. that's, yeah. Mm, important for the technocratic age. Mm -hmm. Like lithium Important and period. nickel, cobalt, that kind of stuff? Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, I got it. That makes more sense now. <laughs> uh, because the, those, again, it, um, there is one thing that is really limited, and that is the finite resources on Earth. Like the finite amount of energy that exists. Hmm. That will not, it, it will never change in its number. Um, it just gets converted into one thing and then converted into another thing, transmuted into one thing, whatever. It moves around, but it's still a finite resource. But, and I think that's, uh, um, I think that, you know, has to do with our obsession with getting off the planet, right? Is to find new, new, um, mineable planets, that have, I mean, I would love to know why people are so obsessed with getting to Mars. It's not about people. It's probably has more to do with mining resources. So it does, does Mars have any, you know, uh, heavy metals or elements that are important for things like computer chips or, uh, solar panels or you know what is the real interest there because it's not about you and me it's not about creating an interplanetary species it's not about that it's about changing the amount of resources we have to work with because the more resources you have the more you can sell the more money you can make it's 
pretty, it's pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I can't argue with that at all. It, it seems like at the end of the day, everything always comes back to uh, basic economics. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's the golden rule. Uh, he who has the gold makes the rules. And if you have more than the other guy, then, then your rules are going to stick. He who controls the spice yep. controls the universe. <laughs> okay. I mean, we know Musk is a very big fan of Dune. So I think he understands that concept yeah. or that idea in that book. So, yeah. <laughs> All right. So you mentioned uh, Mr. Snowden uh, earlier. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to uh to know what you want to discuss uh about him uh because this is a subject that i have not gotten to uh breach with a lot of people hmm. oh um i mean i i think his involvement in it is pretty simple right he was working for the nsa and i mean i'm just giving you what i understand of the situation i could be wrong on all of this because i'm really this is a new newer topic for me um, so he was working at the NSA. He understood that, um, some of the projects, uh, were overreaching in terms of privacy. Uh, people were being spied on essentially, uh, domestically, not just, not just terrorists, just everyone. They were just kind of doing a very wide sweeping vacuum of data. Uh, and he just exposed that. He just uh, released documents that proved that was the that was the, mm -hmm. the function of um, the NSA's programs, which I don't know if it had a name. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was Prism. That was Prism. Okay, mm -hmm. so Prism was so uh, total information awareness was a DARPA function um, program. It, which got publicly killed, and then it just transferred over to the NSA mm -hmm. and got renamed. Okay, so that's interesting. I like how Sharon Weinberger doesn't say anything about that. She doesn't mention PRISM at all. Uh, she mentions the NSA briefly, but she doesn't talk about PRISM or how it went on to just to, to go into the future. That's cool, but... um. Yeah, and then he got in real big trouble because uh, people thought he was exposing things that would harm national security, right? Yeah, that's that's uh, what he was charged under uh, was the the National Security Act exposing uh, national secrets and uh, all that sort of thing. Although, it again, his version of the story is that he was doing what he thought any other patriotic American would do, which was exposing government overreach. Mm -hmm. Because even though the, the government had the capability to do the things that they were doing, obviously they had the capability, they were doing it. Uh, they did not have the express legal authority. Like it, mm -hmm. they would always present uh, very murky justifications for being able to carry out these programs, um, which, you know, again, to me, when, when I look at it, it's, you know, the NSA is, is no different from any other intelligence agency. They're going to do whatever they think they can get away with until they get caught, you know, mm -hmm. no different than the FBI or the CIA or the DIA or any other agency. Um, The where I start to have a problem um, with the genuineness of the Snowden episode, and I, I actually went to the trouble of reading his uh, autobiography. Um, I don't remember if he mentioned who helped him write that book, uh, but it was a very well written book. Um, it's very, very quick, easy read. Um, if you ever, if you ever get a chance to read it, you know, and, and you could think you can tear through it in a couple of days, go ahead. Uh, it's, it's very well crafted story, which is one of my problems with it. Uh, it's, it's a very well crafted story. Um, it does leave out 
some rather striking details, uh, which I can't think of right off the top of my head, but there were questions that I had as I was reading through the book that, that never got answered. Um, not the least of which is, you know, if, if this guy was the threat to the government that they were trying to make him out to be, he wouldn't still be walking around telling his story. Like it just, it, it just wouldn't happen. Like he, he would have mm-hmm. been gone. You know, he would have had a black bag placed over his head. He would have been thrown in a C-130 and the world would never have heard from Edward Snowden again. He would have been found with a shotgun wind to his stomach hanging from an electrical cord. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, And then when you start to factor in things like, uh, you know, he, after he went into exile, Um, He started making appearances at all of these uh, privacy conferences uh, around the world. And usually he would do so remotely, uh, you know, from his, his undisclosed uh, apartment location in in Moscow or, or wherever the hell he's supposed to be these days. Um, But he was always promoting these uh, products to the event goers that were supposed to give them um, greater uh, online privacy in the digital space, right? Like one of the, one of the things that he's a really big proponent of is the onion router. And again, the problem with the products that he's promoting is they can be and have been demonstrated to not live up to the promises that they claim. Um, yes, the onion router can provide you a degree of anonymity when you go online doesn't doesn't matter what what browser you use really um but there are literally like hundreds of ways that you can you yourself can expose your your personal information through the onion router Mm. right like these are these are are known flaws in the technology that have never been addressed have never been fixed and when you bring them up uh, they they very quickly get sidestepped. So it, I don't know. It again, maybe it's it's my cynicism that causes me to look at things this way. But it just seems like when whenever something is deliberately put in front of the public, um, you know, with with the bells and whistles screaming, "Hey, look at me! Look at me! Look at me!" Um, I, I immediately start questioning it because I, I know of I know of far too many stories of whistleblowers who have tried to make things public who end up in a ditch, mm-hmm. right? Never to be heard from again. Mm-hmm. Like, I, what what makes this cat so special that he has been able to to evade uh, the long arm of the five eyes? You know. Right. I think that's a healthy skepticism to have. Um, Because if it really needed to be kept quiet, it could have been. I mean, there are some things that slip through, um, but the response to those things is kind of overwhelming and disproportionate. But I mean, I don't know. Without any sort of um, uh, or um, you know, solid evidence to prove that it is um, kind of like a controlled opposition or a limited hangout or whatever. And you can still persist in the hope that, you know, this guy is who he says he is, right? And that he's actually a patriot, that he's doing the right thing. So you can, you know, keep him at arm's length. Um, but allow, but allow and allow his the information that he's exposed to kind of be, inform your your worldview or your in framing of the world. So you don't have to either you know get on the Snowden bus and praise him and you know idolize him and say he's an American hero and or you know say that he's just a plant and you know a spook or whatever and just to totally disregard. You can have a balance between those two things. Mm. Cause what, what we did learn is we did learn about prism. People didn't know about that before. 
So that is something that did happen that may not have happened without him. Um, and I'd say that's good. It's better to know than to not know that you're being spied on. Because an object, you know, uh, observed is changed fundamentally in its nature. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think that's probably what acted as the impetus for, you know, end-to-end -end encrypted messaging uh, applications like, or I mean, you know, like Telegram or Signal or whatever, mm -hmm. um, and other things like that. So I think those are good outcomes, or at least the the idea that it is good to keep keep an eye on your data and your information online and in the public public sp sphere because you know you can't just exist in lollygag in the world and, and just uh, naively think that people don't care about spying on you uh, when they, they, they do. Um, I mean, one of my younger uh, acquaintances told me, uh, well, you can uh, send, you can send encrypted messages on Instagram. Like they're not going to be encrypted to anyone in Google, you know, Facebook, it, their their whole sphere. They're definitely not going to be encrypted to them. Well, why would they want to spy on me? I'm just an 18 year old girl. Like they want to spy on you. They want your data. It doesn't matter who you are. They want they they want your data if they can get it. It doesn't matter yeah, who it is. It, um... Damn it, I can never I can never remember who it was, but it was at I want to say it was at a World Economic Forum uh meeting. Uh somebody, and this was I think in the 20 teens, um somebody made the statement that data will be the currency of the future. Yeah. Um and again, this is this is not a statement that is made lightly, right? It was it was on a grand stage in front of uh, people who are arguably arguably leaders of industry, right? Um, so, I mean, if if they're using that platform to make that kind of statement, uh, there's definitely a uh, a large amount of weight that is uh, that is going to be behind that statement. And as far as I can tell, that's exactly what. Uh, the technology that we currently have is being geared towards is is the harvesting of data so that it it can be used as a currency the same way that that we use dollars today it's just going to be used to make the world a safer place okay so just lean into it just lean into it <laughs> It doesn't matter. It's safer. Safer or better. Okay. All right. Anything else uh, you want to touch on? No, uh, well, I mean, um, aliens, but, or <laughs> Do we have the enough lack time for thereof. <laughs> no, uh, just one final thought. I think, um, I don't think that there are aliens. I think there, are, there is identified aerial phenomena, but aliens are a great reason to spend money on projects getting people into space for mm -hmm. the aforementioned mining of interplanetary resources. I like that. That's a good way to look at it. Yeah, because again, at the end of the day, it always comes back to uh, generating wealth generating more wealth for the people who already have too much. So it's, you know, the, the old adage always seems to apply, follow the money and you will eventually find the truth. It's, it's really that simple. Yeah. And I mean, I think these people kind of, def they definitely have um, some, some emotional and, uh, you know, uh, they have an emotional stake and they feel like they they have more to gain than just money. Um, I think that they think 
uh, their endeavors to find immortality, uh, omniscience, stuff like that will be aided by more resources. So if they can put more resources and more money into these endeavors, they'll find the way to be immortal, right? Um, and that will be their legacy. They will gift the legacy. They will gift the human race um, a new utopic, I don't know, whatever uh, vision of you know the future. I mean, it's very uh, so hubristic and whatever. They want mm -hmm. to change the world, right? They want to. They want to be immortal. They want to know everything, um, and that's something they're after too. Uh, because they have all, all the money, they they don't need any more. Um, but you can't. What good is money if it can't keep? If you can't use it, you know, um, for what you what you want. So that's what they're trying to do: is become gods, so that they yes. can keep doing what they're doing forever, and shape everything that's happening. So, yeah. Well, and I think I think that's it right there. Is they believe that they can become gods and use their accumulated wealth in order to accomplish it. Uh, and, you know, the, they're determined to, uh, to do it one way or another, regardless of the cost. So uh, it's going to be interesting to uh, see how a lot of these things play out. Um, I don't know yet, um, since I don't really have like a firm idea of when I'm going to reach my final destination, but whenever I get there uh, and am able to get uh, the studio set up, uh, I would definitely be interested in uh, continuing these conversations if you would be interested in doing it as well. And yeah. I know uh, Satya uh, definitely uh, wants us to continue these conversations. Oh, okay. <laughs> he got a lot uh, out of the ones that he's seen so far. So awesome. shout out to uh, Satya Graha, Media yeah. Monarchy Kingdom. Uh, I love that guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. Lots of wisdom there. Yeah. He also does Qigong Tai Chi, which we share that uh, interest. So he's nice. a very, very smart dude. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, awesome. Well, I wish you the best of luck in your, uh, in your road trip. Enjoy it, but also make time to... Um, you know, don't rush and enjoy oh, yeah. the, the journey, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm going to do my best. Uh, we'll see, uh, we'll see how the world visits its, uh, uh, its demons upon, upon my brain, uh, in the course of, of going through that, uh, that journey. Um, cause that honestly, that's, that's the one thing that's, uh, concerning me more than anything else is like, I'm going to be on the road one day and like, that's when the EMP hits, you know, or, or whatever. Um, but I try to keep those things, uh, out of my mind as, as much as possible. So, uh, hopefully it's just a summer of love, you know? Hey, we had a giant coronal hole facing us for the last week and nothing mm -hmm. bad happened. Um, and as far as I know, we don't have any more, uh, uh rotating around the sun that are, you know, going to forecast for at least the next week. So I think <laughs> if it was going to happen, it would have been last week. And I mean, my internet last week was awful. So I think um, there was some sort of subsidiary effects, but yeah. All right, so I think cool. your, the for, forecast looks good for you. And uh, hope it hope it is easy and goes off without a hitch. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, and uh, at some point in the future here, uh, we, will, we will get back together and uh, see if we can't figure out how to fix this damn world. Okay. Yeah. I believe in us. <laughs> cool. We're going right. to find the solution. The final solution. <laughs> Maybe not call it the final solution. All right. All right. All right cool. Take care, Maddie. I'll All talk right. to you soon. All right.